It's late August 2001 in a municipal building in Ben Salem, Pennsylvania. Purdue Pharma Chief Operating Officer Michael Friedman rises from his chair and holds up his right hand. He swears to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And he takes his seat and waits for the questioning to begin. Today, Friedman has been called to testify in front of members of Congress for a subcommittee in the House of Representatives. These kinds of hearings usually take place in Washington. But Jim Greenwood, the subcommittee chair, chose to hold the meeting in a working-class community about 30 minutes outside Philadelphia, one which has been hit hard by opioid abuse. Ben Salem has been experiencing one tragedy after another, the kind of story Friedman increasingly has to publicly address. His company, Purdue Pharma, sells OxyContin, America's best-selling painkiller. The drug is a powerful opioid, capable of bringing relief to people suffering agonizing pain. But increasingly, it's become associated with addiction and abuse. Purdue is now facing civil lawsuits and mounting criticism from all sides. OxyContin is also staggeringly profitable for Purdue. This year, it's on track to bring in over a billion dollars in revenue. It's heartbreaking to see what's happening in communities like Ben Salem, but for high-ranking executives like Friedman, defending OxyContin and protecting the company's profits has become a central part of the job. Congressman Greenwood finishes giving his opening remarks, then starts his questioning. Well, Mr. Friedman, thank you for being here today. I want to begin by getting clarification on a matter. Does Purdue have data on exactly how much OxyContin is prescribed and who is prescribing it? Yes, we do have that data. I believe that practice is industry standard. Okay. So here in Ben Salem, there was a, a doctor who wrote 1,200 prescriptions for OxyContin in just four months. That is an astronomical number. So if you had this data, why didn't you alert the authorities? Surely that volume of prescriptions by one doctor would have raised some red flags. Well, I, I think that might be a misconception. We've partnered with law enforcement, and they've told us that the number of pills being prescribed does not necessarily indicate abuse. But Mr. Friedman, you have sales representatives going into doctors' offices, meeting with them, and seeing who's in their waiting rooms, correct? Yes, that, that is also standard industry practice. So you don't think these sales reps could be more proactive in flagging physicians who are committing fraud? Mr. Chairman, our, our sales representatives are not law enforcement agents. They're not trained to determine who among the 800,000 physicians in the United States is a criminal. Mr. Freeman, you are selling a powerful drug. And the way I see it, your company has two responsibilities. Number one, get the medication to patients who actually need it. But number two, be proactive in keeping the drug out of the wrong hands. You do a tremendous job on the first part, but when it comes to preventing abuse, you're simply not aggressive enough. Sir, we have followed our obligations to the law. We were unaware of any problems with abuse until early 2000, and that's when newspapers in Maine began reporting issues, and the state's U.S. attorney, Jay McCloskey, sent a letter alerting state doctors. That was only 18 months ago, and we have swiftly responded to the situation. Friedman sits back feeling both exasperated, but content he is doing good work in defending Purdue. But what he said wasn't exactly true. Friedman and Purdue's other high-ranking executives developed a story for the public, how it was not until early 2000 that the company learned OxyContin was being abused. But the truth is, by early 2000, they already had evidence of the problem. A Purdue legal secretary had sent a memo describing how people online were talking about crushing and snorting OxyContin in order to get high. There have been many times Friedman and others have repeated their claim that Purdue only discovered the problem in early 2000. But in all of those instances, Friedman had never been under oath, so had never been guilty of committing perjury. From Wondery, I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is American Scandal. In 1996, when Purdue Pharma launched OxyContin, the company claimed the pill's time-release coating made it less likely to cause addiction than other opioids. That claim was a core message of Purdue's marketing, and one of the main reasons OxyContin became the most prescribed painkiller in America. 
but a disturbing pattern soon emerged. Patients using OxyContin reported symptoms of withdrawal and dependence. At the same time, communities began seeing alarming rates of overdoses and crimes committed by people trying to get their hands on pills. It was clear OxyContin was much more addictive than Purdue had let on, and doctors, law enforcement, and journalists all began sounding the alarm. Faced with this mounting evidence, Purdue was adamant that drug users were the problem, not OxyContin. But a trio of ambitious prosecutors from Virginia suspected the company was more culpable than they were willing to admit, and began carrying out a legal campaign to hold Purdue accountable. This is Episode 3, The Cost of Doing Business. It's 2002, and federal prosecutor John Brownlee is looking for his next big case. Brownlee is the U.S. attorney for the Western District of Virginia. He's in his late 30s with short brown hair, a ruddy complexion, and big ambitions. Brownlee is happy to see the direction his career has been taking. Rising to become one of the top prosecutors for the federal government is a good start. But Brownlee has his sights set higher. Someday, he'd like to be state attorney general or even a member of the U.S. Senate. But Brownlee also knows if he wants to find his way into a higher elected office, he's going to have to make a name for himself. And that means prosecuting and winning some big cases. So as Brownlee sits down with two of his assistant U.S. attorneys in their office in Abingdon, Virginia, he begins fishing for information, seeing if there's potential in any of their upcoming casework. The two men, Rick Mountcastle and Randy Ramsayer, give Brownlee a rundown of some upcoming litigation. But it's all mostly small affairs, not the kind of cases that can generate publicity. So Brownlee ends the meeting and shows his men to the door. But as they're about to walk out, one of the prosecutors, Rick Mountcastle, says there is actually one more thing they want to run by him. Might be a crazy idea, but there could be something to it. Intrigued, Brownlee asks what they have in mind. The other prosecutor, Randy Ramsayer, says they've been talking a lot about the painkiller OxyContin. This opioid has been devastating southwestern Virginia. Addiction rates and recreational use are skyrocketing, and more and more people are overdosing or committing crimes to support their addiction. Ramsayer says they want to dig into the issue, because there could be something there, something worth prosecuting. Brownlee is more than familiar with the problems surrounding OxyContin. He's already overseen the prosecution of a doctor who ran an OxyContin pill mill. But Ramsayer says this time, it might not just be crooked doctors or people selling pills on the black market. He's been hearing some disturbing stories about Purdue Pharma's sales reps. Apparently, they're pushing OxyContin aggressively. One local pharmacist even said a Purdue representative had pressured him to fill prescriptions the pharmacist knew were fake. Brownlee nods, seeing where this is going. But prosecuting individual sales reps won't add up to much. They'd press charges, extract a guilty plea, and then move on to the next one. But if they could go after the employer, Purdue Pharma, they could potentially bring criminal charges against the company. And that could be big. It's rare to prosecute a company as large as Purdue Pharma. But there's also good reason prosecutors hesitate to go after these kind of cases. Big companies have almost unlimited resources to fight charges like these, and they can use their political connections to undermine the prosecution. Brownlee knows that if he takes on Purdue, he would likely be committing to a difficult and protracted legal battle, and the government would need a strong case. So Brownlee asks for more details. He wants to know what the prosecution would be investigating. Mountcastle explains that from what they can tell, these aggressive sales tactics are not the actions of a few rogue agents, but it appears to be part of a business model pushed by Purdue Pharma itself. So the two prosecutors want to see whether Purdue is breaking any laws in the way it markets and sells OxyContin. And they want to know whether Purdue was aware their drug was addictive and took steps to conceal the facts. Brownlee is sold. This is exactly the kind of case he's been looking for, because if he pulls it off, he could help a region that's been devastated by addiction, and at the same time, win a victory over a company so large he could help launch the next phase of his career. So Brownlee gives his prosecutors the go-ahead. It's time to start investigating Purdue Pharma. It's December 2002 in Stamford, Connecticut. In the headquarters of Purdue Pharma, the company's general counsel, Howard Udell, is flipping through his Rolodex, looking to find contact information for one of the most powerful and well-connected lawyers in the country. A moment later, he lands on the card he's looking for. Howard Shapiro used to be one of the top attorneys at the FBI. Now he's working in private practice. 
And if he's willing to work with Purdue, he'd likely be a key member of the legal team, helping the company navigate a developing crisis. Purdue was recently hit with a subpoena from the U.S. Attorney's Office in Western Virginia. Government prosecutors there are demanding the company turn over all its records on the development, marketing, and distribution of OxyContin. As the top attorney for Purdue, Udell is no stranger to litigation. Recently, he's been spending his time defending Purdue against civil lawsuits revolving around OxyContin. One suit after another has accused Purdue of downplaying the risks of addiction and over-promoting their painkiller. These civil lawsuits have certainly been a nuisance, but a subpoena from federal prosecutors is something else, an indication that Purdue could soon be in serious legal jeopardy. So Udell needs some help, and Howard Shapiro is the man to call. Even though he no longer works for the government, he probably still has connections inside the Department of Justice and could do something to help steer the prosecutor's investigation. So Udell grabs his phone and dials. A minute later, he's transferred to Shapiro and begins catching him up on the situation. Udell explains that U.S. Attorney John Brownlee is overseeing an investigation into Purdue Pharma. Udell accuses Brownlee of being nothing more than a publicity hound, noting that he even drives around with a portable lectern in the trunk of his car. Apparently, Brownlee is always ready to give an impromptu press conference. Udell believes this whole investigation is nothing more than Brownlee's attempt to gin up some headlines, a cynical ploy to advance his own career. So Udell wants to hire Shapiro and draw on his connections at the Department of Justice, and he's hoping they can find some way to shut this whole thing down. Shapiro offers a note of sympathy, saying he understands where Udell is coming from. But it's a big ask, and he's not sure that kind of intervention might even be necessary. Instead, Shapiro suggests that Purdue Pharma could just agree to the subpoena and then flood the prosecutors with every possible record. Millions of pages of documents. And for the prosecution, discovering anything useful would be like finding a needle in a haystack. That might make the whole case disappear. Udell says he agrees with the tactic. It was already part of the plan. But a needle in the haystack is still a risk. On the other hand, if they manage to stop the investigation... It'll send a powerful message to any other federal prosecutor who might be considering a similar case. So having given Shapiro the lay of the land, Udell asks if he's willing to come on board. Shapiro says he'll do it, but Udell should know something. It's not going to be cheap. Udell isn't concerned. The president of Purdue, Richard Sackler, has given Udell an unlimited budget to fend off any legal challenges. Udell is now spending $3 million a week on average. And while it is an enormous expense... It's worth it for the company. OxyContin is their cash cow. And if hiring expensive lawyers is what it takes to keep their painkiller on the market, then Purdue is willing to pay up. It's 2004 in Washington, D.C., and federal prosecutor John Brownlee is sitting in the headquarters of the U.S. Department of Justice, getting ready to meet with the Deputy Attorney General, James Comey. Brownlee has come here to present the evidence he's gathered so far against Purdue Pharma. He knows his case against the pharmaceutical company is strong, but he also learned that Purdue has been quietly assembling an all-star legal team and working to sink his investigation. Purdue has now hired Howard Shapiro, the former general counsel for the FBI, along with Rudy Giuliani, the former mayor of New York City and one of the most popular politicians in America. It appears that Purdue's strategy is to draw on Shapiro and Giuliani's extensive connections in an effort to pressure Comey to drop the investigation. But Brownlee can't let that happen. He and his fellow prosecutors have uncovered internal documents suggesting that almost nothing Purdue claimed about OxyContin was true. There are still holes in what they can prove, but as long as Comey is willing to look at the facts, he should be willing to resist Purdue's lobbying and keep this investigation alive. Brownlee enters Comey's office and then takes a seat. Hey John, thanks for coming in. I hear you're looking into Purdue. Yeah, that's right. We're still in the midst of the investigation, but we've got a strong case. Well, go ahead and tell me. What's the issue with chickens? Uh, chickens, sir. Purdue? Farms? Purdue Farms? The poultry company, right? Brownlee raises his eyebrows. Is it possible Comey doesn't know which Purdue he and his team are investigating? If that's the case, it must also mean that he hasn't been paying attention to the calls from Purdue Pharma's well-connected defense team. Uh, well, yeah, there, <laughs> there is a Purdue Farms that sells chickens, but we are looking into Purdue Pharma. They make the painkiller OxyContin. 
Oh, right, okay. Well, go on, tell me about it. Well, the first thing you need to know is that Purdue Pharma aggressively marketed OxyContin as safer and less addictive than other opioids. Now, that's not only untrue, but we've also found evidence that the company was well aware that their drug was more addictive than they had publicly claimed. What kind of evidence are we talking about? Well, for one thing, even their own clinical studies showed that about two out of seven patients experienced withdrawal. That's an indication of addiction. Okay, but the FDA approved the medication, right? And it's marketing? Presumably they saw these studies and allowed Purdue to make the claims? Well, about that, sir. Last year, the FDA revised much of the language in the drug's package insert. They even put a black box label on OxyContin, the kind of thing that only goes on medications with the most serious side effects. It was basically an admission that they had made a mistake when they first approved the package insert. But I have to say, I'm also not entirely sure it was a mistake. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, I, I think it comes down to this regulator who oversaw Purdue's application for OxyContin. Now, this guy leaves the FDA very shortly after the drug was approved, and a year later, guess where he's working? You're kidding. No. This former FDA regulator goes and takes a job at Purdue, making nearly $400,000 in his first year. Now, we may never be able to prove it, but we believe he made a deal with the company, approve the drug, and in exchange, get a very lucrative job. Well, that raises some eyebrows, for sure, but it doesn't sound like a smoking gun. No, it doesn't. Not yet. But Purdue sent over millions of documents, obviously trying to bury us. But I'm confident that if you give us enough time, we'll find what we need. Comey drums his fingers together as he thinks. Uh, well, all right, Bradley. You've got my blessing. Take whatever time you need. Go back to Virginia and finish this up. As Brownlee makes his way out of Comey's office, he takes a moment to celebrate this small victory. Prosecutors often have to navigate intense political pressure when they're taking on a company as rich and powerful as Purdue Pharma. But Comey just demonstrated that at least at this point, the only thing that matters is leading a solid investigation and uncovering whatever crimes Purdue is trying to hide. It's the mid-2000s in Abingdon, Virginia. Federal prosecutor Randy Ramsayer takes out a tape recorder and sets it on a table. He confirms the man sitting across from him is ready for the interview, and then Ramsayer starts in with questions, asking Mark Ross, a former Purdue Pharma sales rep, to recount all the problems he witnessed with OxyContin and all the ways his former company chose to ignore the evidence. Ross is here preparing for his upcoming grand jury testimony in federal prosecutor's investigation of Purdue Pharma. Ramsayer and his colleague Rick Mountcastle have been working the case for over three years now. They've read through thousands of documents, amassing an impressive body of evidence showing that Purdue Pharma marketed its popular painkiller with fraudulent claims. As part of the investigation, the prosecutors have been interviewing people like Ross, trying to learn everything they can about the inner workings of the company. But despite some incredible findings, there's something about the investigation that's been nagging at Ramsayer. The plan is to bring criminal charges against Purdue Pharma, the company, but a corporation can't go to jail. So even if the government wins its case, the punishment for Purdue will likely only be fines. Purdue is making roughly $100 million a month selling OxyContin, so even a large penalty will just seem like the cost of doing business. So Ramsayer wishes there was something more they could do. But until that avenue presents itself, he's just going to keep plugging away, trying to build the best possible case against Purdue. So the questioning continues, with Ramsayer asking Mark Ross about his time working as a sales rep. Ross says he witnessed a lot of troubling signs while making his sales calls, moments that made him realize OxyContin was more addictive than Purdue had explained during his training. Ross tells an unbelievable story, saying that one time he walked into a doctor's office and found the physician hunched over his desk, snorting a crushed pill of OxyContin. It was then and there that Ross grasped the severity of the problem. The drug he was selling could cause real addiction. And when asked if Ross told anyone at Purdue about his concerns, Ross said he did. But he was instructed to stay in his lane. His job was to be a salesman, not a member of law enforcement. This gets the investigators' interest, and they ask Ross when that conversation took place. After spending a moment thinking it over, Ross says it was late 1999. Ramsayer looks up from his notes and asks if Ross is sure. 
The sales rep says he's pretty certain, and Ramsayer's mind begins to spin. That small detail not only raises a whole series of questions, it might have just blown open their entire investigation. So when the prosecutors finish the interview, Ramsayer walks Ross to the door and thanks him for his time and watches him leave. Then he turns to his fellow prosecutor, Mountcastle, and says they have to talk. Randy Ramsayer hurries to his desk and rifles through his files. When he finds what he's looking for, he spins around and waves the pages at his colleague. Mountcastle shoots him a look. What's that? A transcript of the testimony that Purdue COO Michael Friedman gave to a congressional subcommittee back in August 2001. Remember this? Yeah. But why are you suddenly looking like you won the lottery? Because right here at the bottom of the page, Friedman talks about when Purdue first learned that OxyContin was being abused. Mountcastle grabs a page and skims the testimony. Oh, I get it. I get it. He says Purdue was unaware of the problem until early 2000. Right. Except now we know that's not true. Mark Ross just confirmed it. The company had information from its own reps about a year before that. And we also have that memo, also from 1999 that Purdue's legal secretary wrote up, one with all the details of people online talking about how to get high on Oxy. We got field notes from other sales reps who said they were seeing signs of abuse in the late 90s. Purdue was clearly aware that there was a problem well before 2000. Okay, okay, well, but we, you know, we kind of figured that they'd been lying about this thing. What's your point? My point is that the executive, Michael Friedman, has perjured himself. He's not the only one. I need to go find the transcript, but I'm pretty sure the chief medical officer, Paul Goldenheim, also testified in front of the Senate and also said that Purdue had no idea there were any problems, not until the year 2000. Yeah, (laughs) I remember that too. Their general counsel, yeah, Howard Udell, he testified under oath as well. And I bet you he said the same thing. So what, you wanna bring charges against them? These guys lied to Congress. Yeah, but, you know, it's not common to bring charges against individual executives at a company under investigation. Well, that's only because prosecutors don't want to upset the stock market, but Purdue is a privately held company, right? Shareholders, they're not going to get hurt. (sighs) Randy, okay, if we do this, we have to make sure our evidence is rock solid. Fighting this is not going to be easy. Yeah, of course, of course, and we will leave no stone unturned. But assuming we can put together a strong enough case, what do you think? I think I'm in. Let's see if we can get some traction. Rams Eric grins. If they do pull this off and bring charges, serious charges, against top executives at Purdue, it could mean actual jail time. Real consequences for people who have been destroying real lives. It's the fall of 2006 in Virginia and U.S. Attorney John Brownlee is sitting at his desk waiting for a call that could announce the fate of his case against Purdue Pharma. It's been an up-and-down few months. In late September, Brownlee submitted a document known as a prosecution memo to his bosses at the Department of Justice. It laid out the details of his team's investigation and described the indictments he wanted to bring against Purdue Pharma. In the memo, Brownlee's team argued that felony charges were warranted not only against the company, but also against three of its top executives. The men had lied under oath about when and how they learned OxyContin was addictive. In part, charging the executives was a straightforward matter of law enforcement. But the prosecutors had another motive. They wanted the executives to flip. After digging through box after box of Purdue's internal documents, they became increasingly convinced that the Sacklers, the family running the whole company, had masterminded all of the most consequential decisions about OxyContin. They were the ones at the root of the crisis now gripping communities across the country. So it was the Sacklers who ultimately needed to pay. But to go after the family, they would need the cooperation of the company's top executives. And those men would have zero incentives to share anything, unless they were facing criminal charges themselves. So the prosecution memo made the case that the executives should be charged with felony crimes, including misbranding, wire fraud, and money laundering. Brownlee sent the memo to his bosses, then began the torturous wait for approval. But something highly unusual happened in the meantime. Brownlee was summoned to the Department of Justice headquarters and told that Purdue's lawyers were coming in to discuss the potential charges and that Brownlee and his team needed to be at the meeting. Brownlee was set on edge. Defense attorneys are almost never granted these kind of meetings with department officials. 
So Brownlee suspected Purdue was engaging in another campaign of back-channel pressure. Brownlee was even more alarmed when he walked into the meeting room and saw who Purdue had lined up for its legal representation. In addition to Howard Shapiro, the former general counsel of the FBI, the company had also brought in Mary Jo White, the former U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York, one of the country's most acclaimed federal prosecutors. Both Shapiro and White were, of course, still well-connected within the Department of Justice, and Brownlee had no illusions about the strength of their influence. Once the meeting began, the two sides butted heads immediately, with Shapiro and White accusing Brownlee's team of overreach, saying it was inappropriate to file charges against executives and claiming any overly aggressive marketing of OxyContin was done by a few rogue sales agents, something the executives had known nothing about. Brownlee hopes his team's prosecution memo will speak for itself and counter these claims, showing that Purdue's executives had committed crimes, first orchestrating a false and aggressive marketing campaign for OxyContin, and then taking steps to conceal troubling reports coming in from their reps in the field. Brownlee believes he made a compelling case. He has to believe his bosses at the Department of Justice will uphold the law and not bend to Purdue Pharma's political pressure. So now Brownlee is sitting, waiting in his office, when his phone finally rings. He grabs the receiver and finds a Department of Justice official on the other end of the line. The official announces that they've made a decision. The department will not support felony charges against the executives at Purdue Pharma. The only charges they will support is one felony count against the company for misbranding, a form of fraud involving mislabeling the medication, and one misdemeanor count of misbranding against each executive. Hearing the news, Brownlee is furious. He can't believe the department is letting Purdue off the hook like this. Even if the company faces a steep fine, they can easily pay it. And without the pressure of felony charges, the three executives won't be motivated to flip. The Sacklers might have helped start the opioid crisis, but they won't have to take an ounce of personal responsibility for it. Brownlee manages to sputter out a response, saying that this has to be a joke. But the Justice Department official reiterates that these are the only charges they're willing to support. Brownlee keeps his mouth shut. As much as he wants to, picking a fight isn't going to do any good at this point. So even though when he hangs up the phone, feeling weak with anger, he knows his team of prosecutors did incredible work, putting together a mountain of evidence against Purdue Pharma. But in the end, it didn't matter. Purdue is going to be able to keep aggressively selling OxyContin. Patients will still keep getting addicted. And the country's opioid crisis will continue to rage on. It's the late 2000s in Tennessee. A young man steps inside a large meeting room where people in business suits are sitting side by side in rows of folding metal chairs. The man surveys the room and heads to an open seat, trying not to step on anyone's toes as he shimmies through the aisle. The young man sits down and then nods at the stranger sitting to his left and right. Then he pulls out a spiral notebook and waits for the presentation to begin. In a few minutes, the young man is going to begin the first day of training to become a sales rep for Purdue Pharma. Like all the other trainees in the room, he's going to learn to sell OxyContin, a job that could be lucrative. But the young man has some pressing questions. He's been reading the news, and he's seen some troubling stories about OxyContin. Purdue Pharma was handed a big fine from the government, and three of the company's executives pled guilty to misdemeanor criminal charges. So the young man isn't sure what kind of bearing that might have on his job, but he wants to make sure he's not making a mistake becoming an employee of Purdue. The door to the conference room swings open, and a middle-aged man heads to the front. Hey, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for coming in today. I'm going to be leading this training, and I just want to start out by saying we're all thrilled to have you here. This is a remarkable team. We work hard, and if you do the job right, well, let's just say the paycheck isn't bad either. But also, the job is rewarding. We're doing good work here, so we've got a lot to cover. Before I get going, though, I want to check in if anyone has any questions. The young man raises his hand. Yeah, hi. Sorry if this is awkward, but um, I've read about how Purdue had to pay this big fine to the government, like $600 million or something. That's a lot of money. So I just want to make sure, is the company going to be okay? Yeah, that business in court was very unfortunate. But there's no need to worry. You have any idea how much money Purdue makes in a single year? No, about $2 billion. 
Yeah, so yeah, to the rest of us hustling for our paychecks, 600 million is kind of a shocker, but no, the company's going to be fine. And look, as long as you do good work, make sure the doctors are taking out their prescription pads, you'll have a job for a long time to come. No worries there. Okay, thanks. But uh, it also makes me wonder if there are going to be any downstream effects on sales. I mean, are you seeing any issues with doctors prescribing? Well, I'm not going to lie. With all the publicity, selling OxyContin is harder now than it used to be. But we can still win people over with our core message. It's a safe drug that can change people's lives. Right. Yeah, sure. Um, but I hate to push back, but the company pled guilty though, right? I mean, they kind of admitted that they were misleading people about the risk of getting addicted. So is Oxy really that safe? Yeah, here's the thing you need to understand. And it's something doctors are finally starting to come around to. Some people are just born with addictive personalities. It's sad, but it's true. If they weren't addicted to OxyContin, they'd be using something else. And no one's perfect, right? That includes companies, which is why we're about to roll out a new version of the pill, one that can't be abused. It can't be abused? No, not this time. With this new version of OxyContin, you can't crush the pill. You can't snort it or inject it, and that means soon abuse shouldn't be much of an issue. That's going to make our jobs a lot easier, especially if you abide by the golden rule. The trainer writes the letters A, B, and C on a whiteboard. This is how you're going to overcome all the doctors freaked out by the news and all the physicians who are all of a sudden feeling resistant about prescribing OxyContin. This is the golden rule. A, B, C. Always be closing, just like that line in the movie. Now I'm going to teach you how to adopt that mindset, that philosophy. And by the end of the session, everyone here is going to be a pro. The young man jots down that phrase in his spiral notebook. And looking around, he sees all the other trainees have also begun diligently taking notes, absorbing the company's sales philosophy, and getting ready to meet with doctors and start earning some real commissions. It's 2010 in southwestern Virginia. A young woman named Victoria is sitting on the edge of her bed in a small studio apartment. The blinds are drawn, and Victoria is in the dark, shivering and sweating. In her right hand, she's holding a green pill. It looks like a normal 80-milligram tablet of OxyContin, but it's not etched with the letters OC like she's used to. The pill's engraved with the letters OP. Victoria has been using OxyContin for years now, ever since she was a senior in high school. She knows what Oxy is supposed to look like, and this isn't it. But Victoria is going through withdrawal. She knows the symptoms. And this is all she has, a pill she found in a friend's medicine cabinet, in a bottle clearly labeled OxyContin. Victoria has to get an opioid into her bloodstream, and soon. Otherwise, this is all going to get a lot worse. So she pops the pill in her mouth, holds it for a moment, and lets the time-release coating dissolve. Then she spits the pill back out into her hand, and wraps it in a $1 bill, folding the bill like an envelope. Victoria then places the bill between her teeth and bites down hard. But the pill doesn't crunch like usual. It feels like she's biting into the world's toughest eraser. Victoria doesn't understand what's going on. She takes the dollar bill out of her mouth and unfolds it. And while the pill is cracked, it is not crushed. This is a serious problem. She can't use a cracked pill for an injection. She can't snort it and swallowing would take too long for it to kick in. So she wraps the pill back up and tries again, biting down as hard as she can. But the pill just doesn't crush. It just breaks into several pieces. Victoria's head is now pounding, and she feels nauseated. She has to somehow find a way to crush this pill. So she rushes over to the kitchen and opens the bottom drawer, where she finds a hammer. She pulls a book from a shelf and places one of the biggest pieces of the pill on top of it. She swings a hammer, bringing it right down on top of the pill. But it won't crush. The pill feels like a gummy bear. Victoria leans back against the wall, desperate and sick. She needs to get a fix. So she pulls out a phone and calls a dealer. When he answers, she says she needs some Oxy, the real stuff, not these pills that say OP on them. But the dealer says he's out. Everyone is. Purdue Pharma pulled the original version, and now the only pills anyone can get are the new ones that can't be crushed. The dealer thinks the idea is that the new pills are supposed to stop people from getting high. Victoria lets out a sob because she feels like she's dying. She doesn't know what she's going to do. The dealer says he has an option, though. He could get her some heroin. Victoria spends a moment considering that. 
Taking Oxy is one thing. The fact that it was a prescription pill somehow always made it seem safe. Heroin feels different, dangerous and risky. The kind of street drug Victoria would never use. But Victoria is hit with another wave of nausea. It feels like she just doesn't have a choice. So she tells the dealer to go ahead and find her some heroin. She'll be there with the cash as soon as she can. From Wondery, this is Episode 3 of Opioids in America for American Scandal. In our next episode, a famous attorney who once battled big tobacco takes on Purdue Pharma. And as the opioid crisis spirals out of control, the Sackler family learns they can't protect themselves forever. If you'd like to learn more about the opioid epidemic, we recommend the books Empire of Pain by Patrick Radden Keefe, Dope Sick by Beth Macy, American Overdose by Chris McGreal, Painkiller by Barry Meyer, Dreamland by Sam Canoas, the documentary The Crime of the Century, directed by Alex Gibney, airing on HBO. This episode contains reenactments and dramatized details. And while in most cases we can't know exactly what was said, all our dramatizations are based on historical research. American Scandal is hosted, edited, and executive produced by me, Lindsey Graham, for Airship. Audio editing by Christian Paraga. Sound design by Molly Bach. Music by Lindsey Graham. This episode is written by Austin Rackless. Edited by Christina Malsberg. Fact-checking by Alyssa Jung Perry. Produced by Andy Herman. Our senior producer is Gabe Riven. Executive producers are Stephanie Jens, Jenny Lauer Beckman, and Marshall Louie for Wondering. Hey, listener, you asked for a little more smartless in your life, and now we are delivering. I am excited to tell you that we are making the full recorded interviews from our smartless live tour available to you exclusively on Wondery Plus. Our first guest you may know is Mugatu, Buddy the Elf, Ricky Bobby, or Ron Burgundy, amongst many other characters. But we know him as America's best friend. He's Will Ferrell. And Will discusses his new life goals, which include referring to money as cheese, and also uh, his commitment to drink at least 50 liters of water a day. Will is just the first live episode with new ones rolling out every Thursday for the next 10 weeks. We're talking with celebrities and icons like the great Conan O'Brien, Kevin Hart, Jimmy Kimmel, and so many more. You'll even get to meet Sean's sister, Tracy, from Wisconsin. These are special episodes that were recorded in front of thousands of our biggest fans. You can listen to these episodes exclusively and ad-free with Wondery Plus. Find Wondery Plus in the Wondery app or on Apple Podcasts.